the, this conference, uh, happy to say, always gains recognition from the Department of Education and Skills, not only by the executives who attend here, but also that the Minister, on a Saturday, uh, gives time to us to come along and talk to us. Uh, we work very much in collaboration with the Department of Education. We're out there, we think that's the best way to get, to get anything done these days, is talk to each other and discuss matters and give our point of view on your behalf. Now, it's just my uh, pleasure now to introduce uh, the Minister of Education and Skills. I have in front of me uh, what he's been doing since, and this is important because uh, you never know where he's going to be next week. So let me give you his, where he is today. Um, he's been a TD uh, since 1982, and he currently is representing Dublin Bay North constituency. Uh, he's been with the Ministry for Enterprise and Employment as Minister for three or four years in the mid-90s. Uh, he also has served as Minister for Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation for five years, 2011-2016. And, uh, of course, overarching, he was Deputy Leader of the Fine Gael Party from 2002-2010. Currently, Richard is... Um, I can minister, take, you drop the word on a Saturday afternoon, called you Minister. Uh, Richard is currently um, the party spokesman for, on finance, and its deputy leader from 2002 to this current, this 2010. So there we are. Um, I think that uh, we're happy to have him here as the minister. We hope he sticks on in that, in that job. However, uh, one never knows. But uh, minister, I'd like to invite you now to address us. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks very much indeed. Uh, I, I had the good uh, fortune to see Niall at work uh, in, was it, in the British Embassy uh, when he was telling the story of the Salmon of Knowledge, which is a very good educational story. And he certainly, I'm sure he enlivened you as he did uh, the, the fascinated audience of English kids who were listening to this story from uh, Irish mythology. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I mean, I, I'm a great believer. I've always been a believer that education has a huge centrality in our ambition as a nation, whether it's whether we want to succeed in great things like science or culture or, or indeed enterprise, or whether we want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to participate to, to their full potential, people coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, people coming with disability. Education has this tremendous force to transform lives, and I think it is something that we really need to value. And indeed, I think historically you can see it has been valued in Ireland. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when we joined the European Union, uh, and shortly before that, virtually, you know, education ended at the age of 14. And there were about 20,000 people going to, to third level. Uh, it's extraordinary the transformation that has occurred since then. We've gone from having one million people at work to having two million people of, at work. We have transformed people's attitude uh, in, in the country in many, many ways, become a much more open country. I mean, even your, I remember then contraception was illegal, divorce was illegal, homosexuality was a crime. You know, how we've changed as a nation. And I think a lot of that, at the heart of that, has been our willingness and, and openness to invest in education as being a, a transformative power that is tolerant and discerning a, as well as reforming. I think that's really important and some, it's a value that I think you can only get by investing in, in our education system. And I think you know, the importance that is, has become even into sharper relief as you look at what's happening politically across our own continent, but also in, in other parts of the world, where I think that sense of discernment uh, that's so important in education has been thrown aside, whether it's be under the pressure of social media or what, but I think people are rushing to adopt positions that haven't been given the sort of consideration that I think a, a strong education system underpinning a discerning citizenship uh, can provide them. So no matter which part of the world our, our ambitions we look at, whether it's to have good citizens, whether it's to have a strong economy, whether it's to have an inclusive society, I think education is, you know, it is the anchor point within, within all of that. And that's why I suppose when I came in here, the thing that I said about saying is setting an ambition, that we want to have our education and training system to be the best in Europe within a decade. And I think it's important to set ambitions like that because it changes the, nat the nature of the conversation that we have. We are, I think, in education used to talking in very narrow input output terms. 
we talk about the pupil-teacher ratio. We don't talk as much about the quality of teaching. We talk about capitation. We don't talk as much about what happens in our schools and how, how inclusive and how they, how they change, how, how, how close they are to being best practice, the best learning environment for, for, for young people to, to, to grow and, and to, to develop. And I think that's why it's really important that we, we look at what is best practice elsewhere. And that's why you know, being the best in Europe means we look at whether it's the Netherlands or Denmark, uh, I know you're a, a Danish speaker today, or whether, you know, wherever it is, Finland, uh, many champion its education system in these times. And, and I think we have to set those sort of ambitions for ourselves to look at what are they are doing, not to slavishly plant them here in our, in our soil, because they, they won't plant. Uh, you can't have a German apprenticeship just brought in and planted into our soil because we don't have their history of gills and all the, that went with it to create that environment. But we can certainly improve by looking at what they've done, looking at what elements can grow and, uh, and develop in, in our system. I suppose what the, our education system is, is, is very different in many ways from, from others. Um, it is a very large and self-assured system, uh, and I suppose people have great confidence in the quality of the Leaving Certificate examination. The, you know, the, it is a good, well-running engine. Uh, many might say it is a bit of an oil tanker uh, and struggles perhaps to change direction when there's a need uh, for, for direction to change. But even though it's that big uh, beast in many ways, it also is extraordinarily decentralized in its delivery. And it's run by you know, a myriad of different patrons uh, rather than their boards of management. It's not run from the center by, by, uh, by a department. I think if you were to critique our education system from the outside, you would certainly say that um, the central services struggle to create a framework for consistent improvement and oversight and development of our, of our, our education system. Uh, it, it is quite decentralized. Uh, and I think we struggle to have those sort of, like I, just to, to take an example from my previous job, you know, we had roughly about 4,000 companies who are exporting. And we had Enterprise Ireland who spent its time thinking about how do we broker new supports to see that those 4,000 companies become the best they can be. How do they improve their technology? How do they become lean and mean in the way they, they operate? How can they break into new markets? We don't have the same system for our 4,000 uh, schools uh, where there is a strong development agency looking at how, how can these, you know, 4,000 uh, institutions become better. And you know, in many ways, you know, companies are producing widgets, whereas these 4,000 schools are producing the, the, the citizens of the future. Uh, and I, I think you know, one of the ambitions that I would have, or, or, uh, as your, your chairman says, if I'm here for, 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 for longer, uh, is to try and think about how do we change that, move from this rather rigid input-output system where everything works pretty well, to one where we set greater ambitions and greater stretch and greater expectation of innovation within these institutions and, and, and greater participation by partners like, like yourselves in the, way, in the way they aspire to, to, to be best. Um, so it, it, it is a, it's, it's a, a, a very, uh, it's a very unusual system and we're highly dependent on inspired leadership, which to some degree happens more out of serendipity than, you know, really the investment in quality leadership that we need for, for, for the long term. So I suppose when, I, when we came to the issue of how do you be best, we set five goals, and I, I still think they, they sort of pull together what we need to. We need to be best in creating a learning environment. We need to have the best learning environment for, for young people to, 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 to develop. Uh, we need to... to make sure that we are the best at including people who come to the system at a disadvantage, be it for economic and social reasons or be it because of, of, of disability or whatever. We need to be the best in, in, in that sphere. We need to be the best at creating a framework where our institutions, be they schools, colleges, universities, whatever, they are continuously improving and they have that ambition and drive to innovate and change and, and, and be better uh, uh, continuously. We need to be the best at building bridges between 
our world, the world of education and training, and the much wider communities which we, 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 who depend upon us and who are influenced by, by, uh, by us. And you know, that is obviously it's enterprise, but it's also community, it's public service, it's parents who, you know, okay, nominally they're partners, but are they partners as real, as, as, in as real a way as, as they ought to be? So that concept of building these bridges, I think, is, is really important to, to our ambition. Uh, and the last goal was that we as national bodies, and I see bodies like uh, Tomas uh, O'Rourke here from the Teaching Council, the national bodies, are we the best? Are we structured best? Are we driving uh, to higher standards? So the framework that we create, whether it's in the, the National Psychology Service or whether it's in the curriculum development or the many agencies that shape our education, are we being best? Are we measuring ourselves against uh, European standards of, of excellence and, and at least matching, if not ex excelling them? So I think that's been the, 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 the sort of the framework within which I've, I've tried to develop our work. And I think we, we, we are making uh, significant progress all, all the time. And I think that's one of the, the strengths of this department. It, it, it is systematic in its approach. Uh, so like in the learning environment, which was the first goal, I mean, one of the things that has been done this year is the class size has got smaller, as, as you probably know, the pupil-teacher ratio went down from 28 to, to, to 27. We have, we're rolling out a digital plan for our schools, which will, I hope, see a, a genuine transformation in, in our schools, because it's possibly the biggest potential transformation in education Will, will occur as the, as, as the impact of digital technology takes hold, because it is about changing your traditional model of the teacher at the front of the class with tablets of knowledge to impart to one in which you have a much more collaborative, and I think the word they use is constructivist, uh, where everyone is part of creating content, and it is through that creation joint creation that you, 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 you excel. I mean, the truth is that most kids have access on a machine like this to more information than any teacher can possibly have uh, at their fingertips. Uh, and the, the task of a teacher is so much changing as they're trying to curate and, and guide and help a, a young person you know, take advantage of this huge amount of information that comes at them, but be discerning, be creative, be innovative in the way they use it, uh, and develop the capacity to work with others, uh, as, in, so, as so much digital technology can, can, can enable. It has, of course, da its dangers, and that's another element of it, learning how to ethically use uh, the, the power that's in, in, in your hand. And we, I know that you're, you, as, as a group, uh, have been very concerned and, and supportive of change, of, of, of efforts to make sure that you, this isn't a new tool for bullying young people, uh, which it can so easily slip, slip into be, becoming. We've also worked, if you like, in that general learning environment, we've taken the initiative to, to seek to bring down costs because we're very, key, very keen that our schools consider parents and the pressure they're under to support their, their children getting through school and look at, at the cost structures and not have unnecessarily expensive items on their list, that they would have multiple locations from where parents can shop around to, 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 to get them, that if they have commitments to individual suppliers, they are tendered every, every three years years, uh, that they're using generic materials, that they've book rental seams, things that are good practice. And to try and make that a reality and to encourage schools to do that, we are proposing that you know, when we come to increased capitation, which hopefully we will be in a position to do, that we will favour schools who have a keen cost regime, who, in, who embrace their parents as partners to make sure that that's the way they, they, they run their, their, their school. Uh, we're also expanding services like the National Education Psychology Service, uh, you know, a, a service that can be so important in providing the capacity of schools to, to deal with the much more complex problems that young people uh, present the, themselves with. The second big goal, as I say, was disadvantage and disability. And again, this year, we've made significant changes. We have transformed the way in which uh, resource teachers are allocated to our schools. And we've moved away from the need for parents to have had very expensive diagnostic uh, 
tests and assessments and, uh, and reports submitted before they would trigger the delivery of support to their children. Instead now the profile, a school's profile is identified and the resource is embedded in the school from much earlier in the year so that schools are equipped uh, with, with the resource to meet both the very complex needs that present with children with, with, with acute conditions with, that, that present learning problems, but also the learning difficulties that arise from other uh, difficulties in their, in their school community. And we've sought to, to allocate that in, in a very fair way, that is based on the school's profile, objectively uh, assessed. Uh, we're putting in 900 extra teachers. We're investing 54 million extra in this service. So this is not a question of, of, uh, of uh, you know, a new system that's saving money. This is a new system that will uh, enhance service. But I think it will be much fairer, and it gives to the school the capacity to use that resource more creatively. And it's not, if you like, a model of withdrawal where you know so much teaching time is allocated to a child, but that the school can decide how do we best cater for the learning difficulties that present here in this school? How do we use individual learning, if that's necessary, group learning, different methods in which you know, that capacity of resource teaching can be deployed. And I was out in, not, uh, not very far away, away here, out in Marino College to see one of the 47 pilot schools who ran it. And it was transformative to see how the whole school ta staff had come to see integration of children with special needs as part of their overall mandate, how they prided themselves, how it impacted on other children who didn't have special needs, but the fact that th this integration model was being used and a changed attitude to, 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 to supporting children was occurring. So it is very refreshing to see that a new model that has been designed with a lot of uh, uh, attention uh, to, to deliver best practice uh, is, is happening and is, is transforming uh, in a very practical way schools. So that, that will go live from, from September. No doubt it will throw up problems. I'm sure we will be, we will be coping with, you know, any, any change of this nature is, is, is certainly going to throw up its problems. But it's absolutely in the right direction and over time it will see the resource follow the, the, the needs of children with the, gr with the greatest needs, whether they be complex or be learning, learning needs of, of, of schools, and I think that's as it should be. We've also this year been able to, to uh, have a fresh look at our disadvantaged uh, schools. These are areas uh, where, where if there's an acute level of disadvantage. Again, we're using a scientific method. This isn't going to be based in future on principles gathering together stats here and there and randomly sending them in and hoping that they hit the target. This is a single, every school is assessed against you know, the, the, the demographic profile of their own students. So they take the students in the school at the time, look at the, if you like, the, the socioeconomic background from which they came, looking at unemployment rates, single parent rates, the education of the parents, uh, the occupation of, of the parents, the overcrowding in, in, the, in the homes. These sort of things that are objectively selected uh, as being associated with difficulty in learning, in progressing in the learning system. And it is those schools that are now being, who are most acute in need, are being given the extra resource. So this year, we're only able to bring 79 extra schools into the system, which is adding to the something like 836 that are now there. So it's, 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 it's not, it's about, you know, it's less than 2% of all the schools in the country. But we are hitting, objectively, the schools with the greater disadvantage. But we're not content to, if you like, just have a better slide rule for dis determining who's in and out, who's out. We're trying to use disadvantage as a tool, the disadvantage program as a tool for being more innovative. So we will be sponsoring clusters of schools to come together and seek to do innovative things in the area of disadvantage to see can we do, do better or to look uh, and they will be by way of a call. Initially I suppose we will try to, you know, we'll try to have a mixture of call and, and selecting schools that we believe will, will, can participate. But our, our ambition and my ambition is to see more opportunity, as I said at the outset, for people to say, well, I'm going to take my school and bring it to somewhere new, and I'm going to look at what's good practice elsewhere and go to work with other schools who have similar problems and try to, to learn. And these will be objectively, you know, the, the learnings from these uh, pilots and, and clusters will be something, will be a resource for us to look at, you know, how do we, how do we support other schools that are, are struggling with similar problems. A third thing we've done in this area, I don't want to spend too much time because I, 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 is we're trying to get more young people who come from 
backgrounds that are, are not typical to end up teaching, to encourage them to become teaching. You know, how much better would it be to have a traveller, a child from a traveller background becoming a teacher, being able to genuinely get traveller children to take an interest in staying in school. We have a huge problem with traveller kids. Only 13% finish their education. Only 1% get to higher education. You know, uh, contrast that with, you know, we're thankfully now at over, I think, 93% uh, completion uh, and uh, Third level participation is up to 60%. You know, so such a contrast for for a community within our within our. So we need to think about how do we bring forward, you know, real role models that can encourage people who might otherwise be switched off by the education system to see it as something that is a is is a, a, a great outlet and an opportunity for them. As I say, the leadership, I mean, our system, because it is so decentralized, it, it so much depends on the leadership of an individual principal and those around them. And that's, uh, that obviously is a huge potential strength, but it's also a potential weakness in our system. And we do want to invest in developing uh, leadership. Uh, we will this year uh, be investing in, I think, a thousand middle management posts. We're, 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 we're bringing forward more people to be leaders within the, within the school body. But not like it was done in the past, where I think more than half of all teachers had so-called posts of responsibility. But it didn't mean they were part of a management team delivering results. It was just like a... A, 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 you know, a bit of extra cash uh, with a name attached to it. We really want to think about how do we create a management system for the 21st century in, in our schools. Uh, and I think that's what we're trying to, to do here. And you know, I, to be fair, the, the unions are, are, are very supportive of, of that sort of thinking. And we've set up a center for, for school leadership, uh, which is, will be looking at how do we uh, create better models to support uh, to support teachers, and we have developed under that mentoring for new teachers, uh, you know, and many other initiatives that I think will make make a, a, a difference. Uh, and I, you know, as I say, I'm also really keen that you know through the way we roll out the digital technology. Again, we'll be looking for clusters. We're looking for leaders within our education system to come together to drive initiatives that are innovative, to set the standard, to drive, you know, to to say what can be achieved, so that we we can over time uh, learn from 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 their from their uh, excellence. I suppose the other big thing in this area of leadership is the quality I mean, of, of our teaching. No doubt, you know, with our, our third level colleges, they are fant fantastically strong and, you know, they're producing very, a lot of young teachers each year, educators at the very highest standard. But equally, we have 100,000 extra people, very, very, uh, you know, very talented people because we've been fortunate to draw our teaching group from the top 10% of their generation. So we have a very talented teaching pool, and that's one of the things that, that really sets us apart. If you look at why our, is our system so much better you know, in many ways than others, we're what, number two in literacy, number six in science, number nine in, 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 in mathematics. Uh, you know, <clears throat> and that's you know, boxing above our weight. I think it's because we do attract quality leadership. But I think equally we have to think about, you know, is the way in which we upskill those through what they call continuous professional development, are we best practice in upskilling our workforce, a, a workforce that, as I say, is providing, uh, you know, is underpinning the education of a million of our young citizens of the future. I, I imagine we're not, and it's one of the things that I will have an ambition this year to look more deeply into, is just how well are we, you know, providing upskilling? How purposeful is it? You know, is it based on, on ex, you know, needs in the school resolved by upskilling teachers to deliver change within that school? I think that, that connection, it has to be done in a planned way and it has to have an impact and we have to evaluate that so that we see that it, it genuinely is, it is performing and impacting. So I think that's a really important area that we, we, we need to, to consider in terms of the quality of the leadership in our education system. The fourth thing is this, and I, I, am I overrunning my time? Three minutes, three minutes. So let's, I've, I've, I'll try and get through very quickly. I think the, the, the fourth thing is really br building this bridge to a changing Ireland. And, and we are a very rapidly changing Ireland, uh, as I say, and, and acceleratingly so. Uh, and we are trying to change our, a, a whole range of things uh, to, to respond to 
you know, the modern expectation of a citizen of its education system, be they parents or, or, or students. As you know, we're bringing forward a, a students and, pair, uh, and parents charter, uh, which is currently just at its legislative pre leg <coughs> uh, stage where the Oireachtas Committee is examining it. And we want to see <coughs> you know, the role of parents identified, the centra centrality of children to the education system set out in each school, setting out how they're going to consult, how they're going to inform parents, how they're going to have feedback from students and parents, how they're going to deal with complaints, how they're going to preempt problems rather than reacting to them when they come. I think a parents and students charter can be a powerful tool at changing the, 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 the way in which our schools run and helping them to, to be ambitious to be the best. This year also we had the fitness to teach rules introduced by the teaching council, which I think is to a degree the, the profession itself coming of age, recognizing that you know there are bad teachers, there should be an opportunity for, for complaint if they're not living up to a standard and that should be dealt with in a professional way, not to be shunted away to the siding and, and, and forgot, forgotten about. We're changing the admission policies and we've legislation in place that will, for example, make sure that there can be no discrimination on grounds of, of race or, or, or ethnicity or uh, gender or any of the other grounds, uh, sexual orientation in, in our schools. It also sets out that every school must accept every child if they are not oversubscribed. They can't say, I'm taking this child, not taking others. It's providing that there will be proper accommodation set out in writing in the admission policy for a child who does not want to participate as part of the general denomination of that school. So if you are a Muslim child in a Catholic school, this, the Catholic school will have to set out how it will uh, provide uh, for that child when, when, they are, uh, when the other children are, are doing uh, their, their, their religious instruction, and that has to be set out. It's banning waiting lists, which of course is a huge uh, obstacle for people, and, and thankfully we're seeing more of them who come back, perhaps had to emigrate and are coming back, or had to change uh, location because of their jobs. Uh, so that's something very, very, uh, very well worthwhile. We're also looking at this vexed issue of the oversubscribed schools, uh, particularly, as you know, at primary level, uh, we have 96% of our schools are denominational. Uh, and when, when, a child, when a school is oversubscribed, it creates this difficulty that a parent might find, who is local, might find that there, an, a, another child is being taken from 10, 20, 30 miles away in preference to a child who lives beside the school. I think people that feel that's manifestly unfair. Or equally, they might find that you know, they feel under obligation to baptize their child just to get admission to their school. So we're trying to find a way of restricting uh, religious uh, grounds for prioritization access to, to, to the school without undermining you know, what is a very valuable thing in our community that many parents want to see their children brought up in their own faith. And I think that's something to be valued. So we have put out a range of options there, which some of you would probably know about, you know, confining religious selection, if you like, to within a, a defined area, be it the catchment or the nearest school. Uh, that's one, one approach. Our other approach is to, you know, simply remove religion as a a choice as, as a grounds of uh, uh, for prioritizing access, but instead have some fail safe mechanism uh, for a school who felt their the ethos of their school was genuinely under threat as a result of 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 uh, you know, that admissions policy. And you can see the possibility, for example, I know a lot of Catholic parents who don't have an educate together school in their area might decide they'd like to go to a Church of Ireland school. But you could see in such a situation that a Church of Ireland school would then become, would cease to be a Church of Ireland school because they would have, you know, so few Church of Ireland ch children, the children that would be admitted would be predominantly Roman Catholic. So you do have to, you know, think about how can we deal with that. So like in all education things, you, you know, you, you're going to have to move and bring a very large group of people with you. And we're trying, we've had a, we've had a recent forum on that, trying to work out what sort of a solution could bring most people with us and, uh, and provide an improvement. Uh, and we do need to make an improvement in, in, in this area. So we are pledged to, to make changes uh, in that area. So just to say, you know, I, I, I'm being very privileged to be given the education brief. It, it is, um, as someone said to me, uh, it was actually David Putnam. And he was describing some of I think he was in, in Malaysia or somewhere. He had a friend of his who was fully hell-bent on becoming Minister for Finance. And then when the allocation of post came out, he was found he was given Minister for Education. And he was down in his boots and very glum. 
And the next, about a week later, he met him and he, 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 his spirits were very high because he realized he was navigating the future, whereas the poor old Minister of Finance was grappling with the impossible problems of the day to day. <laughs> so you know, I think I've learned to see the, the, the merit of that outlook uh, on, on, on the education portfolio. It is something that you can make changes now that hopefully will have its impact, not just maybe five years down the line, but 10, 20, even, even in many years ahead. And, you know, that's the way I look at it. This is an opportunity to try and shape uh, the ambition of this country using education a, as a, a tool to transform our, our society. So it's a fantastic job, and you're doing a fantastic work as a, a parents' council. As I said at the outset, you know, it is a big machine. Um, it isn't, uh, customers aren't, uh, it is a producer driven machine, let us say, rather than a customer driven machine. And it is really important that the voice of, of parents uh, gets expression uh, and gets leverage within that system. Uh, and I think that that will be to the benefit of, of, of everyone. Thanks very much.